So um, this morning, this possibly is the conclusion of our series about how we handle things. And uh, we looked at power, freedom. Last week it was money and uh, good things, but if handled incorrectly can be very, very dangerous. First Thessalonians 4 is going to be the text verses 3 to 8 that I'm going to look at. But before I do, I'm going to reveal to you what we're going to look at this morning. Yesterday, I was walking with my sister, my niece, and my two nephews. I was in Bournemouth. They have a park that narrowly runs in the core of the city center. And I'm walking with them. We're returning home. It's probably about, I don't know, 20 to 8. And something occurred that I have never seen before. I have never, couldn't imagine, I couldn't even see it coming. A young woman rebuked a young man. They're both probably in their 20 years, 20, 20, in their 20s, sorry. A young man she did not know. You know what she was rebuking him about? The way he was dressed. The man was dressed so immodestly that a young woman of his generation who he did not know, they were strangers, had to pull him up and rebuke him. Like, how can you come out your house dressed like this, bro? This ain't right. She, she rebuked him. You guys are bamboozled, aren't you? Should I run it back one more time, Selector? I will. A young man, a man, was dressed immodestly, and a young woman pulled him up and said, what kind of madness is this? <laughs> I was like, I wasn't actually lost. Like the way he was, you gotta think. How how was this man dressed? Jeez. Church, we live in a time where it seems like for many, sexual dignity, restraint, wisdom, and responsibility is at a minimum, or is absent altogether. Something our text is going to make very clear to us is that there should be a distinction. I said a distinction amongst the saints in contrast to the world in how we handle ourselves concerning this matter. So this morning, I want to speak about handling sexual relations with care. Are you ready? Uh, Church should have seatbelts, shouldn't it? Because I would say, put on your seatbelt. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 8. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is avenger of all such and he will also reward you uh, and and testify. The scripture goes on, verse 7 and 8 says, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore he who rejects this does not reject man. You do not reject the preacher, but God, who has also given us his holy spirit so the text teaches us something it tells us that the will of god for us as believers is our sanctification everybody say sanctification the the greek word for this and i butchered up a greek word on on wednesday but i have to say them is hagemos hagemos this is the process of removing extracting or cleansing something uh, for use and so Water purification is something being, is water being sanctified, basically. There's bacteria and there's all this stuff. If you drink it, it's going to make you very, very sick. And so it's gone through a process to make it pure and to make it drinkable. And so after the process, the water is better. It's the same thing of smelting raw metals where you put raw metals under Uh, intense heat and you get rid of all the other elements that are in there so it becomes pure gold or pure silver or pure platinum or whatever the metal may be and always in every case after the purification that the gold is shining 
the metal, the silver is better. It is the same thing with the refining of oil. So you can dig, dig oil and you can strike oil, but if you don't know how to refine it, then you can't really make too much money of it. But it's through the refining process you can make the blessed petrol. People can run their car. Now people are going to pay you a lot of money for that. And so it becomes more useful, it becomes uh, resourceful after the process of its purifying, of its sanctifying, hagamos. They're all better once gone through this process. This process is the inner working that God is doing in us, redeeming us from the power and the influence of sin. Sin in the human personality creates a lot of problems. A lot of the issues that we've had to deal with in our life, in our family, a lot of things that are happening in this world is the effect of sin working in and through human personality. But in God, in salvation, Jesus is sanctifying us. Those elements that are not good, those things that defile and corrupt, he wants to purge them, he wants to extract them, that we can be better, that we can reflect his image. He's refining, he's purifying, he's making holy in our actions, in our thinking, and in our hearts. Uh, salvation is being made right before God. Sanctification is growing in godliness. So when you give your heart to Jesus, your behaviors or a lot of your behaviors might still be present, evident. But you are made right before God, not because of your own works, but because Jesus paid the price for your sins on the cross. But as you grow in God, you enter into this process, this refining, this sanctification, and now you are beginning to reflect your heavenly father. You're growing in godliness. The product of sanctification, this process of extracting this stuff that defiles and hinders, the process of it, or the the success of it brings a dominion to a person's life. A dominion. A person gets saved and have no dominion. They're still ruled by all of these different things. But they grow in God. God begins to give them an authority, a dominion over self. A victory. A peace. A joy. A dignity. An honor. Purpose. Blessing. Holiness. Which means to be set apart. To be, to be like God. But here's the reality of this process, is that you can work against it. You can work against it. You can resist the spirit. You can harden your heart towards the word of God and ultimately hinder and work against what God is doing in you. And this is how you can have two people who possibly had similar experiences, have similar issues, both get saved at the same time, and one is powering on for Jesus victory and dominion and peace and the blessing of God and the other one is, 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 is severely struggling and years and years and years and years pass and one is flying and the other one is, is more or less in the same place you can work against this process I believe the mindset of the believer concerning our lifestyle in God and what God is doing us doing in us should be this can I show you it Romans 6 verse 19 Let's put it up. Okay. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. I love the way Paul just be speaking like that. So what other terms are you going to be speaking in, man? Come on. But he's just saying, I'm just speaking in layman's terms, right? So he says, here's what he says. For just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So let's stop right there. What is he saying? He's saying, before you were saved, and the way you didn't have no restraint concerning sin and concerning the desires of your flesh, whatever you wanted to do, you did it. Hey, you want to talk this way? You'll talk whatever. You want to go to that place? You want to be more? You want to? You did. He says, the way you gave yourself to that, he says, this is what I want you to do now you're in Christ. So now, 
present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. That's pretty good. He says, hey, the way people in sin make themselves slaves to sin. He says, when you're in Christ, uh, he says, present your members as slaves to righteousness for holiness. What our text does is highlight probably one of the primary things that hinders, hinders the process of what God is doing and trying to do in the believer's person. This sanctification, growing in godliness, victory and dominion and peace and purpose, all these things that he wants to unfold out of one salvation in the Lord. This thing here, this is the stumbling block. He gives us an instruction. He says, because the will of God is your sanctification, he says, abstain from sexual immorality. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, verse 3, that you should abstain. Everybody say abstain. abstain. They don't teach that in school, you know. Did you know that in sexual education? Have you ever heard the word abstain? Ain't, ain't, ain't. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, maybe I just find that funny. You better teach your kids. That's what I'm saying, man. Abstain. Introduce that word. Ab phonics. Let me not go there. <laughs> King James Version. I like the King James Version. I'm always cool. It says fornication. <laughs> what do I find that funny? I don't know. <laughs> Sexual immorality. Fornication. The Bible says in the Greek. It is the word pornea. What does that sound like? Porno, yeah. That's where the, the Greek word, that's where the English word come, comes from. From this. It's sexual perversion. This thing will mess you up. It will mess someone else up. It will mess up a family. It will destroy a marriage. You will not have dominion as a Christian. You will not have victory as a Christian. You may not even make it. If you don't repent, you will not make it. No fornicator will inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's stated multiple times in the scripture. Because of this thing right here. It is no joke. Here's what the scripture teaches us in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Flee. Flee is like, uh, there's a, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier on the stage is undrained. It's barking wildly and it starts to run after you. You see that kind of running you're doing there? That's what I, that's, that, that's, a, that's a perfect mind illustration for you to compare. Not walk. It is not a, it's not a casual walk away from fornication. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're just, you're just kind of waiting around. <laughs> just loitering, man. It's a sexual sin, man. Let me just say. Uh, no, no, no. It says flee. Every sin. Then it gives us the why. I, lo I love the scriptures. It doesn't, give us the, doesn't just give us the why. It gives us the why. It says every sin a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality does what? Sins against his own body. So the scripture says you sin against yourself. Sanctification is the inner working of God in a human, in a human who's given their heart to Christ. But this thing, it sins against, you see how it obstructs the process of what God's trying to do. I'm trying to purify the water, but every so often you're pouring all this disgusting stuff into it. It hinders the process, doesn't it? So the scripture says you've got to take this thing seriously because you're defiling yourself. Now, let me make this clear today. The Bible is not anti-sex. We're like, isn't it not? <laughs> what <Wow>, my days. <laughs> it is God's invention. It is the peak of physical intimacy between a male and a female. The Bible says the two shall become one flesh. There's a word, it's called consummate, consummate. This is to make a marriage complete 
by having sexual intercourse, consummate. And it's the idea of they become one. They have done vows before God, the church, family and friends. They are witnesses to their covenant and then they are to go and consummate. This is God's idea and become one. God said to Adam and Eve in the beginning, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Now, he's not actually asking them personally like <laughs> create a million people, but they were to have many children. Well, to do that means a lot of baby making had to happen. So this is God's instruction. This is God's creation. This is God's idea. God created it. God endorsed it. It is not an idea or a concept that is taboo in the scriptures. It is not something that the scriptures are bashful concerning. Sexual intimacy is not edited out the Bible. Genesis 4.1, let's put that up. Here's what the scripture says. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. That word knew is not like he knows how tall she is. He knows what her favorite color. Job. He knew his wife. And if we're written, no, no, that's not what he's talking about. And she conceived. Yes, it is what he's talking about. And bore Cain and said, I have required from the Lord. The next text that I got here is verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> And she bore a son and named him Seth, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom he can. I can tell you for free. That's not the only time that Adam knew his wife. <laughs> the Bible tells us in Genesis 24, verse 66 to 67, 67, it says, Then Isaac, <laughs> Isaac brought her into his mother's tent, speaking of his wife, Rebecca. And he took Rebecca, and she became his wife. That's saying they consummate. And he loved her. Of course she did. Now, this is the funny part. Now, Isaac was comforted because after his mother's death, everything's going to be okay, Isaac. <laughs> everything's going to be okay. I said, it's going to be okay. <laughs> oh, my days. The Songs of Solomon is an entire book dedicated to the intimacy between a groom and his bride. Now, it's very easy for people to super spiritualize this book. It is very poetic. There are lots of metaphors and, and allegories. And, and, but church, it is very clear. You, you have to overlook the reality of what the book is talking about to not see it and to understand what's being communicated. Songs 4, verse 11 to 16, gives some dialogue between uh, the bride and his groom. And, and here's what he says. Can we put up my scriptures? I'd rather read off the screen. Okay, we're not going to do that. We're not in sync with me today. Your lips, oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Now he's dropping bars all day here, okay? Honey and milk are under your tongue. And the fragrance of your garments, they're saying what she smell like, is like the fragrance of Lebanon. I can only assume Lebanon smell good. <laughs> then he starts to describe her as this kind of garden. He says, a garden enclosed is my sister. That's a respectful term. My spouse, being a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard, orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna and spikenard, spikenard and saffron. He's trying to describe the most beautiful garden you ever see in your life. Calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters uh, and streams from Lebanon. We still ain't got my scripture up. Here's what the Shulamite says. So this is, that's, that's the, bride, the groom. We got like how many people back there? Like one, two, three, four. And so um, this is what the Shulamite says. The Shulamite's response is this. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden, Lord of mercy. <laughs> that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. Now, you can spiritualize that as much as you want. But to me, I'm like, you guys need to get a room or something, man. Like, come on. <laughs> this is affection, attraction, romance, intimacy. They're all being celebrated here. 
whole book is dedicated to it. And so the scripture doesn't pull back on the pleasure of sexual intimacy. These two, in, they're having a good time. Okay, this is what they have. You guys don't believe they're having a good time? Man, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Let me just move on. So it says all this. It celebrates this, but then it's underlined with this warning. Songs of Solomon 8 and verse 4. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So it says there's an appropriate context for all of this. And the scriptures are very clear on the appropriate context. Proverbs 5, verse 18 to 19. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of of your youth. Bible's not anti-sex. Bible's not trying to hide it, not bashful about it, not like, oh, it's taboo, you don't talk about that. No, no, no. No, no, Bible's saying, no, no, rejoice. Have a good time with the wife of your youth. And it's wonderful that it says youth because the world teaches you that you get married when you're old. The Bible teaches you you get married when you're young. Like, you're too young to get married. That's a very anti-biblical statement. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Amen. And always be enraptured with her love. And so the Bible's not pulling away from it. The Bible's like, hey, go for it. But he just says, the wife of your youth. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, marriage is honorable among all. So don't look at it. Hey, man, they're married. That means they do. The, yeah, they do. But it's honorable because they're in marriage. Right? And the bed undefiled. So what's that talking about? You know what that's talking about. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So God's very clear on context. He created, he endorses, he doesn't shy away from, he educates concerning, and he says, hey, this is the context. It is an institution of God. Marriage, intimacy with the marriage, is an institution of God recognized universally celebrated and honored go to many different nations and there's a big celebration. what's going on what's going on all these people all this celebration man they've been doing it for days what's happening they're getting married you go on any continent you're gonna find people that hey even if you go in some of them deep deep jungle tribal they they'll have something where you realize she is with him you don't or he gonna come for you it's universally recognized celebrated and it is honored someone stands up and says oh i've been married for 40 years we instantly we honor it matthew 19 verse 5 6 says and for this reason many shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so this is jesus referencing back to genesis so then they are no longer two but one flesh therefore this is powerful. What God, what God has joined together, let not man separate. What God has joined together, what God has made one. That is a powerful, profound statement. Marriage is something that God in heaven would sign off. And say, yeah, I joined him. Bind. So you think about it. It's like God said, like, I recognize every time a man and a woman get married, it's like it's noted by me. I join them together. All other sexual activity outside of marriage, outside of this covenant bond of love and commitment between one man and one woman till death do you part, and that God seals, comes under the title sexual immorality. So we have clarity what our text is talking about. It is not an anti-intimacy text. The Bible puts things in its correct context. But outside of that context, engaging in such things, it is now deemed immorality. The Bible is very clear about the realities of sexual immorality. You take this thing out of its context, a lot of problems, a lot of dysfunction, a lot of drama. Sexual immorality is simply sex handled incorrectly. Sex is a good thing. Not one amen. Amen. But when not handled well. Man, my church is holy. Sanctified. I'm going to call my pastor friends and be like, no, 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 no. These people are clean. 
I was like, sex is good. And they were like, no. <laughs> you should have said inside of marriage. And then we would have said amen. I said, all right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But if handled, not handled well, can be very dangerous. Sex can be monetized. Can be monetized. Whether it's a lady walking the street in the evening, whether it's her posting images and people paying for it, whether it's a, a movie industry, it can be monetized. It can also be weaponized. Sex can be used as a weapon whether it be to manipulate and control or seduce or even be or even force upon another. This thing handled incorrectly, I'm telling you, man, it could be very dangerous, man. Cause a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of emotional baggage to a lot of people. You unpack this thing too early, outside of its context, devastating. Get young people Young boys, younger, and they get exposed to this stuff at a young... I'm telling you, man. Start to see the ripple effects of it. How it plagues their person as their adults. And what is it? Because something sexual happened. And so this is not God just like railing. Like, oh, this thing. No, no, no. He's, he's trying to warn us. And he's like, open your eyes. And he's like, look around. and Look at the source of a lot of issues. And you realize there was something sexual going on. And it wasn't handled correctly. You may get pleasure, but outside of this appropriate context, it will come with a lot of other things that are not pleasurable. Generational cursing is not nice. Not nice. Heartache is not nice. Relational Complications are not nice. Emotional baggage isn't nice. A perverted perspective of woman or a perverted perspective of men is not cool. Mental health problems, identity problems, and a very undesirable future. These things ain't cool, man. But a lot of them unfold because this thing has not been handled correctly. Now, this doesn't just speak to people here. Maybe you're single or you're dating or whatever. It speaks to everybody. My people too. Sexual immorality. Most of the dysfunction regarding this matter in the Bible is played out by a lot of married people. You consider Jacob and his wife Leah and his other wife Rachel and his other wife Bilhah and his other wife Zilpah. Yeah, and the, other, the, the latter two were given by the first two. This is madness. This is not what God established. He's in a polyamorous marriage. And you see, it, you read it, and when you read the dysfunction in his home, come on, man. His brothers are going to sell his youngest son into slavery and lie to his face and make him believe that lie for years. Why? Because of the madness that was going on in dad's bedroom played out with his children. Reuben, Reuben his eldest. So you've got to always consider the eldest son in these dysfunctional contexts. Reuben actually went up to Jacob's bed and slept with Bilhah. Bilhah's one of Jacob's wives. Maybe she was a bit younger because she would have been, I can't remember she was Leah Rachel's handmaiden. She would have been younger. Reuben's the older. Reuben's seen his dad's dealings. So hold on, you got one, two, three, four, five. That, that perverted, that little boy. Now he feels the way for him to be, have dominion and be a man is I need to go up onto my father's bed. He, wanna, oh. he got Judah and Tamar, same thing. Judah had some issues, man. How did Judah, Judah, Judah Tamar is his daughter-in-law, right? And then obviously, you know, the story, she married one son, he dies, married another son, he dies. And his sons didn't know how to, well, especially his second son, man. He was, he was, he was funny too. This is a generational thing, man. And then Judah... Goes up one day and Tamar pretends to be a prostitute. How did she know that plan was going to work? I disguised myself as a prostitute. I know Judah. I know that man to stay. And she set his behind up. Yes, she did. And he fell for the trap. Because she knew she don't. And what Judah is the son of Jacob. 
This thing is playing out generationally, man. When it's not handled correctly. David suffered the same thing. The incestual relationship of Ammon and another, one of his other daughters was called Tamar as well. This madness going on, but Amnon was his eldest son, and Amnon saw dad and his madness. Wife number one, wife number two, wife number three, concubine number one, concubine number two. Concubine is a woman that's yours, but not, you're not married to her. So it's like, how does that work out? But he's the king, he can do whatever he wants. But your son, your son is watching you. And now he wants to sleep with his half-sister, one of your other wives. It's the madness. It's not handled correctly. And it brings, that whole situation was like a nuclear bomb in the household of David. All the pain and agony of this man's life came out of that. You go and read it for yourself. Solomon's polygamy was record breaking. <laughs> a thousand women in your life, bro. A thousand? Sir, that is something else, man. These guys, they suffered the most pain and the most loss because they couldn't handle this thing right. And there are many married people, they're all married, who have blown up their homes, opened the doors to the demonic, defiled their children because of sexual immorality. It's more than just a physical thing. It's emotional, it's mental, it is spiritual. The two become one. Think about that text. The, you, the Bible's deep, man. It says when a man commits it, he sins against himself. We, I don't think we fully process that. But what can help us maybe process that is we can understand. We, we should all appreciate that sexual violation is like one of the worst. It's one of the worst. Rape and, and, and pedophilia, things like that. You know it's worse. It's like, you know what I'm saying? Someone do you wrong. They stole your person's money or they done some physical harm to them. But when you hear that there was a sexual violation that took place, you know that's the worst, man. Because you know this thing is more than physical. This is more than you just punched me in my face and you walked off. And you see the ripple effects of it. How the person could be so emotionally scarred and hurt. And how the, the healing, the deep work of healing that has to take place in that individual. Because this thing is just more than physical. A person sins against themselves, man. Samson lost the anointing, made himself easy pickings for the enemy because he did not know how to possess his own vessel. You think about this, man. Culture, media, and society is telling you the complete opposite of what I am saying this morning. This is like, because you're hearing the complete opposite all day. You're watching it, you're listening to it, you see it around society, you see it, your family, whatever. You see it, and so you hear it, it's like, oh my days. It's like the devil's having a field day, he's having a laugh. And he's messing people up from the earliest age possible. Uh, they want to end the school nice and early. They don't teach knife crime when they're nice and early, do they? No, 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 but we'll teach them about this thing here. And the word abstain never comes up. They just preach all the madness. What, what letter in the alphabet are you? It was like, oh my days. They teach, you, did you, did they teach the children the alphabet, and then they ask them, what letter are you? Like, what kind of madness is that? And you know what's sad is you get some crazy parents that would encourage it and facilitate it. Their words, with their own actions, with their own references that they're establishing. Our text says, you shall not be like the unbeliever. It's saying, as the people of God, we shouldn't be reaping the same whirlwind as those in the world who do not know God concerning this matter. The same dysfunction and drama from sexual sin that is happening in the world, those who do not believe, should not be experienced by the people of God. I tell you this right now. You just live in clean will save you from about 80 to 90 to 95 percent of the drama your peer is experienced who is sexually immoral. I'll tell you that right now. Half of the heart, all oh, the heartache and the drama and the madness, you're actually being saved from that. 
There are people who live in shame and humiliation. They have to bury it deep within themselves. But if you had to see some of the sexual perverse things that they get up to or that they have done in their past, the shame, the humiliation. People live with that. People exist in crazy relationships. She's nuts and you're nuts and this whole thing is nuts. How did you, what, what? It, it don't even make no sense. You hate each other, you love each other, it's, it's a madness. Kick you out, come back in, take me back. It's like, it was, what's going on? This is crazy. People live in that like that is normal. Find themselves in all these crazy situations and relationally just kind of end up being a resounding failure. That's what happens. People live sexually more, they don't handle this thing right. You just, like, it's failed in this area. No wisdom, no dignity, no blessing. When you're preposterous, when you're unbiblical in the handling of this, I'm telling you, it is the gift that just keeps on giving. How you handle yourself concerning this truly does matter. The Bible says possess, one should possess his own vessel in sanctification, not in passion of love. So the scripture has given us insight here. It's given us instruction. So it says... Handle yourself in the trajectory of what God is doing in your life. That's good. Not in the lesser way of dead works of the flesh that ruled you prior to Jesus. Don't confess Christ and go the opposite way concerning this. Confess him and go his way. Therefore, what needs to happen is our thinking needs to, it needs to change about this. See, what society has done is it's made an idol of pornea. Pornea, that word, actually figuratively would be used as a term for idolatry as well. And they actually go, to, they actually go hand in hand. Um, idolatry and sexual sin. They're, they're, they're more or less like, they, they're, they're holding hands together. That's the only way I can describe it. Because it, it's society's obsession. It's an idol. It's an idol. We gotta parade this, we gotta pump this, we gotta what everything, everything. It's like you can preach on anything. But not this pastor, man. Come on, man. I just came to church, wanna hear a word. You're hearing a word. But this thing has been elevated to an idol. It's like if you're not doing it, if you're not engaging it, you're nobody. You're nothing. There's an obsession. Sexual activity has been elevated to a marker of identity. So you gotta consider that. So what you do in the bed, that now becomes your identity. Hence, what letter are you? None of those letters, man, what are we talking about? I'm a child of God. I, got, I have a name, <laughs> I have a family. Like, we, we, but, but it's, it's identity, I'm this, I'm this. And they just, and, and it's, so you're saying what you do, that's your identity? It's now shaping language. I, you, let me not get into it, man. man yeah, I'll keep you here all day. There is a shifting. There's been a redefining. Marriage has been redefined, church, in our country. There's a shifting of moral compass. Called good evil, and now evil is supposedly good. The idolatrous connection and correlation has been there for millennia. What am I saying? I'm saying a lot of stuff you see today, this is nothing new. You know your Bible, man? Ain't nothing new, man. Man, that's what you, man gets to a place or humanity where they get to a place of prosperity and they conquer and they come to a place of affluence. You know what happens then? They get more. Happened with the Romans, happened with the Greeks, happening with us. You know what it is? We just got money now. We live good. We ain't got real problems. And so now we worship the idol and we become more and more and more immoral. And our kids reap from the madness. Idolatry and sexual sin, man, I'm telling you. They've been, the golden calf at Mount Sinai, they worship the thing, they rose up to play. They're not, like I said, not playing Connect Four. They're doing <laughs> ding. Balaam's plot with the Moabite woman. Send the woman in, they'll become sexual more, and they begin to worship their idols. In, uh, in Ephesus, uh, I forgot the temple, uh, but they used to have temple prostitutes. So one of the ways of worshiping was to go up and go with a prostitute. This is the tune that the world dances to. 
that sexual relations is everything. It is an idol of life, uh, and it encourages and implores that you take it out of the God-given context. It's not everything. Getting married is not everything either. You marry someone, they're an addition to your life. I hope you know that. They are not the answer or the completion of your life. If you believe that, why, why, why believe that, man? <laughs> why, why? And they'll be like, hey, Pastor, man, this guy, man. <laughs> Jesus is the answer. Amen. Jesus is who you're completed in. Not another person. Trust me. If our minds are not renewed, we're going to struggle to have dominion in this area and live for God and enter into all that God has for us. If lust is Lord, single or married, unfortunately, you start to become an accident that's waiting to happen. Your relational sexual advances is going to become an entry point of chaos for you and the unfortunate soul who found you attractive <laughs> and was dumb enough to attach their life to yours. <laughs> Proverbs 7, 22 to 23 says this, immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Oh, man, sir, why are you going after her for, man? Or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver. That means he's going to bleed slowly as a bird hastens to the snare. That's a slow and painful death. A bird's trapped in a snare, it struggles, struggles, it struggles. The more it struggles, the more it afflicts itself, the more it bleeds out. These are two extremely painful deaths. Arrow in the, they say you get stabbed in the stomach, that's just, you're just gonna bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. Slow death. He did not know it would cost his life. Bible does not pull punches concerning warning us, warning the people of God and saying, don't let this be your portion. I'll tell you what the worst place is to be before I move on. It's, think, it's living in sin, thinking you're right before God. That's the worst place to be. Like, all right, you're living in sin, you're in sexual sin. But then to say, no, I feel like I'm right before God. You're going to have to explain that one to me. This is why Paul and the New Testament addresses this so, clear, so clearly and with clarity. He's addressing it. He's writing to his church in Thessalonica. And he also writes to the church in Corinth. And Jesus addresses this concerning the church of Thyatira. The Bible is very clear about it. In no uncertain terms. That this will be a stumbling block in your walk with God. The moment we stop being biblical about this matter, we're in serious trouble. Now, let's move on. If you want to live for God, if you want to enter into purpose, you want to be used by God, you believe you have destiny in God, like God created you in this time, in this life, for a purpose. How you handle or mishandle this matters and should be important to you. Dominion, the blessing of God, honor, and dignity in Christ hinges on this. Your sanctification, which is the will of God for your life. The Bible says, let each possess his own vessel. The vessel, our own person, the vessel of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, we have a hidden treasure in these earthen vessels. He says that each of you, there's no differentiation of relational status, it's to everyone. Single, married, dating, that Jesus would be Lord concerning this matter. The wonderful thing is this, as I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up now, is that the text speaks of us being vessels of sanctification and honor. That's, that's, that's incredible. What a glorious truth that is. That's a wonderful truth. God speaks to us. People have done some things. People who have violated what the scripture says and have sinned in this way and have suffered because of it. There's shame and the guilt. You know all the stuff, the emotional, the oh, feeling so hot under the collar while you're listening to this. Uh, that, that, that thing. He says, you. He says, I want to make you a vessel 
of sanctification and honor. That's an amazing statement that he makes. That's an amazing reality and truth that the people of God must understand and accept. And understand that's your identity. A vessel of honor and that God is of sanctity, that God is purifying me to bring out the, the God ordained, God imagined, God created me. That's what he's doing. He's getting rid of all the, the sins influencer and, and he's lifting you up that you would bear his image. I thank God in Christ there is forgiveness, that there is healing concerning this, and that there is redemption for the soul. We can be redeemed from the curse and renewed in our minds, and we can be set free. But not only that, but there is a purifying that would take place within the depths of our person. That's beautiful. So think about it. God's not just saying, like, I forgive you. Like, okay, you come to the cross, you repent. Man, I lived a life, yep, sexual sin, I regret it, man. Da, 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 but this is not, I want to make it right, etc. I'm going to repent. Da, da, da. I forgive you. God's like, no, no. He sees all the effects of that within your person. He says, now allow me to purify you. So you don't have to live in the shadow of it. You don't have to carry the shame of it and the emotional baggage. This thing doesn't have, no longer have to influence, influence your person and your personality. I say, let nothing influence you but the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, a vessel of sanctuary and of honor. There is a bestowing of honor. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, prior to this, these, this verse, verse 11, he starts listing what the church in Corinth used to be. And every letter of the alphabet, they were that. And so he says, such will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But he says, and such were some of you. But you were washed. Consider these terms he's speaking here. You were sanctified. Cleansed outwardly, cleansed inwardly. But you were justified, made right before him. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The world will lead you into that madness. And once you're in it, it's going to leave you there. It's only Jesus Christ that will pull you out. That's all the world's going to do. Friends, media, blah, blah, blah. Pull in. Watch this. Get bound to this. Uh, be more. Have kid here. There, 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 there. Dysfunction. Baby mama drama. This happened. Blah, blah. Then it's immorality. And it's, it will lead you. And it will just leave you there. You're like, done. But it's only Jesus Christ who will look at a people in such a circumstance and say, I would redeem you from that. I will wash you, sanctify you, and justify you. That, that word sanctify, hagamos, doesn't just speak of extracting out things that are impure and stuff, but it also speaks of making of great value for purpose. There's a purpose in his process. He says, I, I'm, my, why, why the sanctification? sanctification? He says, I'm making you a vessel of great value. He's like, don't devalue yourself. He says, this is, what, this, is, this is my will for you, to lift you up, to be a vessel of great value. But you can have dominion, you can have victory over the enemy in this area of, this, of, of, in this area of your life. And be free from any bondage and insecurity and identity confusion and perversion. It's the work of God in the individual in Christ. And the text is calling us to live in sync where God is taking us. That's all he's saying. He says, this is where God's taking you. He says, synchronize yourself to that. That's what he's saying. He says, this is what God's doing in you. This is what he's going to do for you. Regardless of your past. Yeah, but I, da, 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 regardless. He says, I'm trying to. I'm taking the, the painstaking process of purifying you, renewing your mind, changing your heart, healing you, bring you to a place of honor, value in the highest degree. The very thing, sexual sin, sexual immorality, and pornea strips a person off. God is seeking to restore in conduct, in thinking, in character. It is his will to place his blessing on your life, that you enter into his purposes, his calling, and his destiny. Us who were so lost in our sin can receive such a grace. 
You gotta handle this right this morning. I'm concluding, I'm concluding now. Handle it right in your heart and in your person. And there will be an honor on your life, regardless of where you're at, that the world could never afford to bestow on you. The honor that God will put in your life, if the world got all this money, can't afford that. The purposes of God, your value in Christ, your future, your destiny in God, can be secured or hindered and lost by how you handle this matter. Because there's some things that are not evil within themselves, but determined by how we handle them can either be a blessing or could be a curse. How you handle this matter, church, surely does matter. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes in respect to God person next to you.